uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Sanem uh, Solomon. Um, as we move forward, I will do the introductions and then we shall be doing uh, the handing over at a later stage uh, to our co-hosts. Um, yes, Boo. Now, when you look at um, agenda issues in the in the world, uh, in, you, you find a lot of interesting aspects. And in particular, when we look at uh, one of the studies done by the World Bank in 2018, uh, it shows that women play a very big uh, role in terms of African trade moving across the borders. And the study shows that quite a lot of work is done by women uh, doing business across borders. And it's the extent to which this is done sometimes is not very visible, uh, but again, the fields that they cover are quite broad and uh, it includes all aspects, uh, whether it is issues of trading in uh, food, issues of trading in manufactured products uh, and issues of trading services. Now, they do this through whether it is small businesses uh, for which they predominate uh, or in big businesses uh, and in which also they play a part. But there are challenges that they face and these challenges include the following that is uh, working in formal sector and often subject to a lot of harassment and extortions. Uh, some of them face uh, denial of access uh, to key trade networks. Uh, more than men uh, face the same. Uh, the, it is time consuming uh, for trade, uh, filling in trade procedures and documentary requirements, uh, which heavily are geared towards denying uh, women uh, such access. And then work, the women working to produce exportable products and services are typically less able than men to get the inputs and materials that increase the, their productivity. The other point that face, they face is difficulties in getting access to and being in the process of developing trade market and products uh, regulatory requirements, hence the ability to comply with a lot of things. Um, so in this process then, uh, we realize that it is important to bring out uh, this webinar uh, so that some of these issues can be discussed to see how um, they are addressed. And let's move. Next. Uh, you move too fast. Eh? So then, um, just slowly. So when we look at um, uh, the, the interventions that have been thought to, to be included, uh, you realize quite a lot of institutions have put in mechanisms to address these issues. So through the agenda and, uh, and trade practices and policies in Africa, the World Bank, the United Nations Economic Commission for uh, Africa, the African Union, the FCFT and the standardization community, uh, that is the UNEC, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, ISO and ISO are seeking to improve the understanding of the barriers that women face uh, in uh, trade. Uh, with re key recommendations to help postmakers uh, facilitate the participation of women in trade. In particular, these are uh, the following recognize the role of women uh, in trade and ensure that officials of, at all levels understand their importance in, in, in trade. Ensure that rules and regulations, standards, technical regulations, conformity assessment, governing trade are clear, predictable, and widely available at the border, uh, which is clear. A critical for women traders are working with very limited margins in that in, in the informal sector. So some of these are the key issues that they face. And sometimes the way they are done is such that getting the information is hard. So can we make it easy for them to get this information? Uh, prioritize the simplification of trade documents and regulatory requirements uh, to and enhance their participation in uh, the same. So if you look at uh, uh, regional economic communities like East African community and COMESA, they have what they call the simplified trade regimes, uh, which try to make things easier for uh, small businesses to access uh, trade across the borders. But I think this is not enough and therefore it is important that 
improvements are done and to ensure that access is enhanced. Uh, the fourth is design interventions to help trade in ways that ensure that women benefit. Uh, pro for example, programs that support improved access to information uh, we, we will assist women entrepreneurs uh, to access the otherwise male dominated uh, trade networks, help women address the risks that they face in their trade related activities, given that they are typically more risk averse uh, than men uh, and responsible to different, in different ways. So a lot of these things uh, need to be looked into within the context of enhancing that trade access, the trade access mechanisms. And such, of course, should include aspects of uh, what kind of risks are involved, particularly what kind of risks uh, do women face when it comes to accessing uh, trade um, across the borders. So various trade policies and instruments in the African content of free trade, trade area highlight the agreements issues which are expected to create new uh, trading and entrepreneurial opportunities for women in the in formal and informal uh, sectors, including agriculture, manufacturing, and sector and services sectors. Such include Article 3E uh, e on the gener gen general objectives uh, that aims to promote and attain sustainable and inclusive socioeconomic development, gender equality, and structural transformation. Uh, 27 to the, uh, of the protocol on trading services, making it explicit uh, with references uh, to improving the export capacity of formal and informal service suppliers with a particular attention to micro, small, and medium uh, sized operation operators and women and youth suppliers. So quite a lot of um, research has been done and uh, when, it, when you look at the emphasis has been, how do we make it easier? How do we make it profitable? How do we make it worthwhile uh, for women and youth enterprises uh, to actually trade across the borders, particularly in services which are considered uh, minor services, but which nevertheless form uh, good livelihoods uh, for uh, the women and youth. And these are the challenges that you, we face. And I think quite a number of uh, um, uh, webinars and uh, seminars, workshops have indicated that these are areas that need to be addressed. So women, women's lack of knowledge about their rights under the trade treaties and protocols make these problems even worse. Uh, let's move. Next. So, um, Within the UN system, uh, under uh, its um, SDGs, uh, goal number five, we have gender equality. And what it emphasizes is that we should end all forms of discrimination against women and girls everywhere and ensure women's full and effective participation and unique opportunities for leadership, whether it is in business uh, or in any other uh, sphere. Facilitate the adoption and strengthening of sound policies and of enforceable legislation for the promotion of gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls at all levels. So this also is strengthened by what we have as Agenda 2063, particularly aspiration number three, uh, which says that an Africa of good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice and rule of law, and a continent where democratic values, culture, practices, universal principles of human rights, gender equality and justice, and the rule of law are entrenched. Aspiration number six of Agenda 2063 also emphasizes that it should be an Africa where the government is people-driven, unleashing the potential of women and youth, and has full agenda equality in all spheres of life. So those emphasis that Yes, we are in a continental as well as a global arena, and we recognize the role of enhancing agenda uh, participation in all spheres of life uh, to ensure that we do not leave any section of the, uh, the, the population behind. Next. Uh, next. Uh, um, so the, the, the AU um, has developed what we have as the AU gender policy and this action plan that provides a framework 
uh, for the realization of gender equality, fairness between men and women, non-discrimination, and fundamental rights in Africa. Uh, this is uh, contained within the 20, 2003 Maputo Protocol on the African Charter on Human Rights and Human and People's Rights on the Rights of Women in Africa, the Solomon Declaration on Gender Equality in Africa, and the post-conflict -conf reconstruction adopted by the heads of state in 2006. For this, the African leadership reaffirms a commitment to the principle of gender equality as enshrined in Article 4 of the Constitutive Acts of the African Union, as well as other existing commitments, principles, goals, and actions set out in various regional, continental, and international instruments on human right, human and women's rights. Next. So we have emphasized that uh, we have that sound uh, policy uh, framework within the continent that should ensure that women, uh, youth, and men have no discrimination uh, in participating in the continent's uh, uh, development and prosperity agenda. So gender in, when you have the gender and uh, agenda in standardization, and uh, in this we have that given that standards play a role in all spheres of life, including socioeconomic and, um, economic, uh, and governance and policy measures, manufacturing trade and entirety, uh, the entirety of life, there is increased call uh, by the UN and UNEC and ISO to ensure that gender, the gender agenda uh, is considered in standardization with respect to governance and leadership and in all activities that uh, are related therein. So we do have uh, within the UNEC working party six uh, on regulatory cooperation and standardization, we, the initiation of the global declaration for gender responsive standards and standards development. And that is one of the things that we have tried at also to ensure that it's taken on board. And the way it, lo it is looked at is that as far as, as, as a way of furthering equal participation by both genders in economic decision making as instruments for women's health, safety, and well being as tools for sustaining uh, sustainability reporting. So the declaration recognizes that the content of standards and engaging in the standards development process are opportunities for women's empowerment. Uh, similarly, in ISO, you have Gender Action Plan 2019, the purpose being deepened the understanding of gender representation in ISO work, assess the gender implications of standards, ensure that ISO work and activities include a gender perspective. So if we look at this, and I think it's an emphasis we've been uh, trying to put across in most of our committee work, that when you're looking at a standard that is to be implemented, ensure that it is gender sensitive in a way that it, uh, it, it takes into account uh, gender perspectives that might hinder its implementation in a way that benefits everyone. Uh, next, please. Next. So for ISO, the initiatives that have been put in place is a signatory to the Global Declaration on Gender Responsive Standards, uh, ISO programs, projects, policy documents, and constitution uh, that don't discriminate against women, inclusion of women in staff, leadership, uh, goodwill ambassadors, um, where we have a, a number of people, and then we have promotion of gender balance in technical committees. Uh, this is not an obligation uh, we have to report uh, at the council level, uh, the inclusivity of the technical committees. And whenever we are making calls for uh, experts to be nominated, this is one of the aspects we actually uh, do call upon our member states to consider. Uh, we, we have open participation of both male and female students in the ESA competition. Uh, promotion of African SMEs and Made in Africa products uh, of all genders. Uh, under this, uh, I may wish to point out that uh, in some of the projects we're implementing, we have a mandatory uh, requirement uh, of either 30 or 40 percent, and this is signed up so that anytime we are doing certification training or recruitment of uh, SMEs in, in terms of competition, we have a good representation of both genders. 
the standards and deliverables are gender responsive and gender policy documents are being considered. This is under consideration. Uh, also member states like South Africa through SABS is currently a signatory to the global declaration. And the focus is on participation of more women in standardization activities, engagement with the government and policymakers to ensure the development of gender sensitive trade policies and development of standards in sectors that impact uh, economic, uh, women's economic empowerment. Uh, Rwanda Bill of Standards through standard, uh, the RSB uh, is also a signatory to this uh, international declaration. And one of the standards launched uh, in 20, uh, 20, March 2023 uh, is one of the best uh, standards that the best practices standard that has been released within the continent that uh, addresses issues of gender sensitive policies and practices in their workplaces. Uh, next. So, um, although SUBS will talk about this um, uh, later on, uh, we wish to point out that uh, this is one of the earliest uh, founded organizations, which has been in existence from 1947, uh, 1945. At the time, uh, the massive post-war rebuilding effort by the major powers was undertaken with growing recognition of the need to manufacture goods, uh, product, goods and products uh, to a common and agreed set of standards. So if you look at that, that's when you also find that ISO was being founded at the same time. And standardization facilitated and enhanced international trade, offering objective benchmarks to ensure minimum safety and performance integrity of products and improving applicability across a range of national markets. So SABS is a statutory body that was established in terms of the Standards Act in 1945 and continues to operate in terms of the latest edition of the Standards Act of 2008 as the National Standardization Institute uh, in South Africa mandated to develop, promote and maintain South African national standards, promote quality in connection with commodities, products and services, uh, render conformity assessment services and assist in matters connected therewith. It's also a founder member of the International Organization for Standardization and has built a reputation globally as a long-standing and widely respected role player in international standardization and the leading standardization body in Africa. Internationally, SAPS has been a pioneer working with the British, uh, British Standards Institute to develop the forerunner to the current ISO 9000, a series of standards uh, in quality management. The South African Bureau of Standards is associated with various regional and international uh, standards bodies. Currently as an ARSO member, SAPS is also a council member and champion, champion member of the of ARSO, facilitating strategic standardization policies, including strategies and policies for gender mainstreaming and standardization. Uh, next. Um, so the objectives of the webinar, I will not read through all of them. Uh, so of course, uh, having that facilitate, facilitate better understanding of gender equality in gap inequality gaps in standardization to create awareness of the need uh, for gender responsive standards and to create awareness in the strategic importance of standards as tools for ensuring gender equality and increased competitiveness of women enterprises. So among all the other, we have nine objectives in this. Uh, I will not go through all of them uh, for purposes of saving time, but is, is to highlight that aspect of ensuring that we recognize the role of standards uh, in this. Um, uh, for today's host, uh, I'm standing in, uh, but uh, we have to recognize uh, the host and the, the, the co-host. Uh, the host is the uh, Secretary General. I'm standing in for him. Uh, Dr. Zegimara holds a PhD in analytical and environmental chemistry. Uh, from let me remove this uh, from the School of Chemistry, University of Wits, uh, Wits uh, South Africa, and the postdoctoral studies from the Wits um, University and University of Botswana. Um, he has been in this uh, the standardization career for a secret general from 2012, and has of course been steering the organization. Uh, to fulfill its mandate since then. Uh, the host, uh, the co-host, uh, Dr. Satwil, let's move. Next. Uh, the co-host, uh, uh, our co-host today is uh, Dr. 
Sad will be soon, be soon currently uh, serving as the acting chief executive officer at the South African Bureau of Standards. Uh, with almost 20 years experience in standardization, he has taken on standardization roles um, and responsibilities at the international level that includes membership of ISO Council, a council board member of the International Electrotechnical Commission, IAC, a, mem a council member of the African Organization for Standardization and council body member of the African Electrotechnical Commission. So over the, the years, his expertise has been instrumental in advancing the development agenda of national standards bodies with a career focus on the African con continent in support of the African continent of free trade area at the FCFTA and Sadwin currently serves as an ISO council member for the 2021-2023 term. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree on sciences from the University of KwaZulu Natal and a doctorate uh, in technology from the Durban University of Technology. Uh, at this point in time, uh, uh, allow me, Dr. Sadwil, to, in, uh, to invite you to address and give your opening remarks uh, to the webinar uh, before I also invite the moderator at a later stage to proceed with the webinar. Uh, kindly welcome. Oops. Thank you, uh, Ruben, and um, thank you, colleagues. Um, thank you to, to ARSO for um, hosting this very important uh, webinar and, uh, and SAB's colleagues who have uh, been instrumental in making sure that uh, we provide guidance on, on this very important topic and to be co-hosting this event as well. It's certainly a great pleasure for me to be associated with this very important discussion point around uh, uh, women in standardization and, uh, and trade uh, on this 35th or so uh, webinar. So uh, as part of my opening remarks, just gonna give you a few, uh, something in context around South Africa and particularly the SABS on, on gender equality. Colleagues may um, re uh, recall that in 2019, when we hosted the ISO General Assembly uh, in Cape Town, um, we had signed the Declaration on Gender Responsive Standards and Standards Development, which is an initiative of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, UNECE, um, aligned to um, the United Nations and the UNSDG 5, which is gender equality. So this uh, document that we signed has a declaration, has a number of commitments uh, as signatories. And basically what we need to do is create and implement gender action plans. And this is to support the gender balance and inclusivity around standards development processes, as well as strengthening uh, the gender responsiveness of standards and standards development. SABS is a public entity, and certainly we've taken the initiative to pledge and embrace gender responsiveness throughout our business, not just the division that develops our African national standards, but throughout the business. And I'll highlight one or two initiatives uh, in uh, the comments to follow. So as a signatory to the Declaration on uh, Gender Responsive Standards and Standards uh, Development, it demonstrates the Bureau's seriousness about contributing towards the well-being of uh, South Africans and participation of all citizens of the country in the economic growth activities. Colleagues, um, standardization, and you all know uh, this, uh, this, this, this theme, is that it is a very important facilitator of trade and promoting women participation in the development of standards that facilitates trade is a strategic way of involving women in trade. It goes without saying that involvement of all genders and particularly women paves a way for the active and informed participation in industrialization as well as economic development. For society to be uh, very active and, and proactive, we need to make sure that there's active participation um, of women um, in standardization activities, including the development part of it as well. You also may appreciate that globally, and even in, in your own national standards bodies as well, there is inadequate participation and representation of women in standardization. SABS has taken on this challenge and it has committed as a signatory to the UNSDG um, 
GRSSD initiative has crafted an action plan. And this action plan is aligned to the ISO action plan that has been developed in 2019. And our action plan is very specific around gender equality targets. Um, a few of the targets just to, to mention is that, well, the first thing that we need to do is to develop a baseline. What is the current gender representation of demographics in our technical committees, subcommittees, and working groups? Having understood that, and at the time when we did the survey, it was 21%, uh, pretty low in terms of participation. Then we start putting in targets in place. And the targets were, how do we get women represented leadership positions, women in leadership positions in our technical committees and subcommittees? And we put a target of 30% uh, from the initiation point over a three-year period. Secondly, how do we put a target in terms of general participation of women in our technical committees and subcommittees and our working groups? And we put a target of 35% 35, 35 over a period of three years. To date, we are sitting at about 24%. So we moved on over two years from 21 to 24%. Not uh, the, the target and, and the movement that we would have liked, but I think there are a number of hurdles and challenges that we need to address to increase this number significantly over the next three years. I would also like to just emphasize that on a global basis, SABS has put targets in terms of gender demographics of 50% women representation in the entire complement of staff in the organization. And we have staff membership of 750 in the organization. Currently, we're sitting at 48% of women representatives as staff members in the organization. We would also like to make sure that we adopt best practice tools and support committees in the development of gender responsive standards. We'd also like to promote and, and provide advocacy initiatives on gender equality. One additional highlight over the last year was that SABS concluded a woman in leadership program. And this was around capacitating middle and executive management uh, women um, in, in completing their courses, which was a one-year course. And I must say 43 of the participants who have initially started off the program concluded it a year later and successfully graduated in March, 2023. And this is one of the initiatives of ensuring that we have capacity. We develop the flexibility around initiatives for women to progress uh, in the organization. And last but not least, we joined the ISO men mentorship program to make sure that um, we support ISO and national standards bodies in providing experiences, case studies to promote gender and gender responsible standards, um, not only a national perspective, but supporting also at a regional perspective ISO and IEC at the international perspective. So those, with those opening remarks, I'm looking forward to the valuable discussions and presentations uh, and look forward to engaging further. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sadwi. And uh, from uh, your remarks, I believe South Africa is well positioned in this uh, webinar to share with us uh, your experiences as subs as well as getting more inputs from the rest of the continent. Uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome the moderator for this um, uh, webinar today, uh, Sanet Solomon, uh, you're welcome. And uh, Sanet Solomon uh, is a lecturer in the Department of Political Sciences at the University of South Africa, uh, UNISA, and alumnus of the University uh, of the Free State. She's inter an internationally published author Council member of the South African Association of Political Studies, and she's currently an adept, uh, an adept moderate, uh, analyst and moderator. I believe I, we will benefit from your experience, and I welcome you to take the, the ship and steer it forward uh, in the, these interesting discussions. Uh, kindly welcome and take over. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It is an absolute pleasure. 
Um, without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, our first speaker, Ms. Sandra Umungueza. She is a project coordinator at the African Organization for Standardization since 2020. Ms. Sandra holds a bachelor's degree in finance and investment uh, analysis from Emity University in India. And she is highly skilled in, in terms of project management and holds a variety of qualifications and capacity building in terms of standardization. Ms. Sandra's presentation is titled Developing Gender Responsive Standards and Making the Standardization Process Agenda Agenda as a cornerstone for splurging inclusive sustainable development in terms of international and regional, uh, regional policy initiatives in the role of RSO. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We look very forward to your presentation um, and your presentation is uh, scheduled for just 10 minutes so uh, without further ado the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon thank you very much Ms. Sullivan. Um, I will start by um, projecting my presentation if you allow me. Um, Ms. Sandra, you can just click on the share screen option. There you go. Uh, you can just click on the share screen option. Again, we just saw your presentation. It's the green button just in the center of your screen. Um, we can see your screen, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, my presentation is going to be um, Dear colleagues, I think that our first speaker is experiencing slight technical challenges. Um, we are just trying to assist her in terms of her presentation. So um, just bear with us. We should start in a minute or so. Um, Ms. Solomon, please confirm if my screen is visible. Yes, we can see your screen. Oh, thank you very much. So um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, as presented earlier, I'm Sandra Umugwaneza, and uh, I work at the ASO, uh, African Organization for Standardization. So for today's uh, 35th session on webinar, uh, it is jointly organized by ARSO and SABS. Um, the focus is on women in standardization trade and trade. So my topic is on developing gender responsive uh, standards and making um, making the standardization process agenda agenda and as a question to sparring inclusive sustainable development, international and regional policy initiative, and also showcasing the role of ARSO. So moving on the next uh, slide, I would like to talk briefly uh, about ARSO. 
Um, ASTO is an African organization, organization for standardization. It's an intergovernmental organization, which was created um, by the African Union and the United Nations of uh, Economic Commissions for Africa, uh, shortly uh, called UNECA. Uh, that was in 1977 uh, in Accra, Ghana. So currently, um, the membership has reached uh, 43 African governments, which uh, are all represented by their national standardization bodies. Uh, when we look at uh, what ASO stands for, uh, we have values, visions, and missions. Uh, starting with the values, we have five, um, which uh, it is in integrity, excellence, accountability, inclusivity, people-centered, and reliability. Uh, in the values, we will see that I've highlighted the fourth one, which is inclusivity, whereby it will bring us to the main topic we have today in this webinar. When it comes to the vision, um, the vision of ASO is to be an excellent uh, standardization institution, whereby the quality culture is promoted, uh, which also leads to supporting the industrialization and sustainable development in Africa. Lastly, on the mission, uh, ASO's mission is to facilitate uh, intra-African and global trade by providing harmonized African standards and conformity assessment procedures. All this, um, the work that is done under the under ARSO, part of what is happening right now is all included in the ARSO st strategic plan 2022-2027. Moving to the next slide, uh, which is the main the main um, the main topic of today it is uh, what is gender and what are the issues that are being uh, discussed uh, nowadays or uh, globally, be it globally continental, uh, I mean the African continent, or else or else at national level. We will start with uh, gender. When we say gender, what do we understand? When we say gender, it is uh, a set of attributes. It is not, uh, it's identities, expression, uh, societal roles. Uh, it's very important to differentiate gender and sex. Sex is the second point, whereby it is just a physical char characteristic. It's the way somebody was born. That's why it is biologically predetermined and refer to the physical differences. So once we've understood the difference between the two, uh, we now go to the uh, we now go to the gender equal e equality. What is gender equality? It's not. It doesn't mean that uh, a man should be equal to the woman. It doesn't mean that they should have the same height or do the same work or do do the same have the same ideas. It's complementing each other. It is having the opportunity to have the same rights at all levels, at uh, be it at uh, in public or private sector. That is what is called gender equality. It is uh, where uh, gender gender recognizing the diversity of men and women and ensure that. Uh, their different needs and interests have equal importance. Um, and lastly, uh, sorry, uh, going to gender mainstream mainstreaming. When we say gender mainstreaming, is uh, what what does it mean? It means it's adopting uh, a process of adopting and promote gender equality in end planned action. The main reason, the main the main purpose is to have uh, a process in place, have process, a way of facilitating in order to reach that uh, gender equality that is being talked about here. Once we have the gender mainstreaming uh, put in place, 
it gives the opportunity to have uh, equal rights, opportunity, access to resources. You find uh, we, men and women are treated equally, uh, decision making in the leadership and in all uh, in all aspects of life at all levels. Then, um, but by doing that, that is when the women uh, empowerment is reached. Women's ability to enjoy the rights and entitlements, um, and to make effective choices with respect to the economic, economic, social, and political sphere. This means that uh, it gives women access to access to resources. It doesn't discriminate. It doesn't. It allows uh, women to. It gives a chance to women to make a decision that can impact the be it business or in different life in different um, activities they are doing. I uh, will now move to the next um, slide, whereby we now look at uh, what is being done, be it or at a global level, African level, but also including what is happening at ARSALEV. This has been uh, mentioned by the ARSO technical director. So I will just go through briefly, whereby I will, on my screen, uh, there is what is being happening, what is happening at, uh, at the, what has the UN done so far um, under its uh, SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, 2030, whereby we find goal five that is focusing on gender equality. This gender equality um, has uh, a few a few milestones. These few milestones were achieved when the Universal Declaration Human of, on Human Rights took place in um, 1948. Then this was followed, it did not stop there. It was followed by the milestone you might be able to see down whereby we have the Mexico City First Women Conferences Conference, uh, 1979, the adop adoption of CDAO, um, 1980, Copen Copenhagen um, Second Women Conference, and also 1985, the Nairobi Third Women's Conference, and lastly, uh, the Beijing Fourth Women's Conference that took place in 1995. So um, uh, at the at 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 the AU level, at the African Union level, we also do have the Agenda 2063. This also was mentioned by the technical director. Um, I will mainly mention the the what is what is in the Aspiration Three whereby we have good governance, democracy, respect for human rights and justice of the rule of law. Um, all these, in all these aspirations, this, this um, four items that are in aspiration three, the promotion on, on gender equality is being um, promoted, but also in aspiration six, where we have the, the African Union looked at uh, an African continent that has got uh, development, where development is uh, people driven and where women and youth um, have full access, uh, gender quality in, in all spheres of life at all levels, be it um, public or private sector. Um, on this, under this aspiration six, we have uh, the, some policies that uh, uh, have been put in place. Uh, these policies we have, uh, for example, we have the AU gender policy and its uh, action plan. We have the Maputo Protocol 2003. We have the solemn declaration on gender equality uh, in Africa that was um, adopted in 2006. But also, we there is the strategy um, for gender equality and and women's empowerment 
GEWE. Under this, um, the, still the AU strategy, we have six pillars, namely uh, what they are looking at is economic empowerment and sustainable development, social justice protection and uh, women rights, leadership and governance, gender management system, women, and lastly, um, media and ICT. So at the Um, another another policy that uh, has been put in place at the UNEC is the assessment on gender equality and empowerment of women and girls. Also, uh, lastly, on the on when we are looking at what is happening globally and uh, on the on the African continent, we lastly have what is happening. Um, at the AFCFTA, this uh, African Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement has um, an annex whereby um, whereby there is also the agreement on including the gender equality. Under Article Three, we'll have uh, where the gender equality is uh, is being emphasised on, but also Article Twenty Seven. Point two uh, D, where there is supporting uh, supports improving export and capacity of uh, SMEs. So, what are the opportunities that uh, these these uh, gender equality uh, agreement, this gender equality gender quality, will bring to to the table for for the African continent? Since we know that uh, women are in different sectors, they need to have uh, export capacity. With uh, at a, at a personal level, uh, I might say that if we take an example to example of agriculture, you mostly find uh, women at a low level uh, produ production. But when it comes to it reaches the export capacity. It starts uh, showing that uh, men are dominating the, the that level. So all this, when when gender equality is emphasised, there will be increase of export of female dominated sectors, in manufacturing, uh, agriculture, even in value addition. We will find value. Uh, we will find women present. So um, this this provides the mechanism to address the non-tariff also non-tariff barrier under the TBT Annex Six and SPS. Um, also, the gender mainstreaming in the process remains the key building block to the realization of full benefit from the trade opportunities. So, gender equality is very important because. Uh, for all these aspirations, for all these, uh, for the Africa we want, for for the for for the economies to grow, women must be involved. That is why all these policies that uh, that uh, have, have been mentioned, be it at um, global level, continental level, um, has have to be adopted. Moving to the next slide, uh, we we'll now bring in the. I will now bring in what is uh, what is being done at UNECE, whereby there is a working party on regulatory uh, cooperation and standardization. This has got uh, a few initiatives that are focusing on the role of standards which is a way of furthering equal participation by both genders. Uh, this will promote economic decision-making. will also allow women to have uh, um, health and safety, well-being, safety and well-being uh, at, at, at a level that is equal to, to, 
to men. And also it will be a tool of uh, sustainability reporting. At the ISO, ISO level. Ms. Sandra, ISO you have one more minute left. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, we can see that we have a few priorities area uh, as listed below, uh, four, five of them that also are promoting the gender equality. Um, moving to the last one, at ARSO level, um, ARSO is working with other organizations to, ha has joined other organizations to promote the gender equality. As you can see on the picture uh, on the screen, we do have uh, women that are being involved in all the activities um, that happens at ARSO level, be it in the staff, in the leadership, we do have the goodwill ambassadors. Uh, for example, the, the, Her Excellency uh, Prof. Mrs. Amina Gurib Fakim, who's uh, the former president of Mauritius. We have the uh, former president, Dr. Yves Gadzikwa. And also we have various consultants and uh, uh, chair, chair leadership that uh, on, in the work that is happening at ARSOLEV. Uh, lastly, is um, in supporting the gender equality uh, under the different various projects that are taking place at ARSO level. We particularly have the FDB project, the project that is being sponsored by AFTB, where you can see the various uh, percentages of participation that is being looked at. At um, another example is also secre secretariat staff, where we have, whereby we have 47 percentage as women, 53 as male. Uh, the total participation in the work and also is 30 percent for women. The leadership in this technical committee is at 29. So the work that is happening right now is to increase participation. Uh, getting awareness on why we women need to be given a chair at the table and be able to contribute, um, especially on activities that are and standards that are gender sensitive. Uh, this is this was my last uh, uh, my last slide. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, we will be doing the Q&A at the end, um, but we do have uh, one question for you, Ms. Sandra. Um, in terms of your presentation, it was a very comprehensive overview in terms of um, ARSO as well as the gender representation. It is a pity that we couldn't finish the entire presentation. Um, just one question that we are most fascinated in is what are the main policy pronouncements which you can relate the gender mainstreaming and standardization process given the example of the AU in terms of your particular presentation. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sandra. Thank you very much uh, for, for the question. Uh, I would just say that um, as, as mentioned in the presentation, you might have seen that uh, following, uh, it was mentioned even uh, at, a, at, global, at the global level, we saw that uh, following the milestones that have been uh, achieved by the UN, but also at the continental level by the, the three, the aspiration three, the aspiration six, whereby women are being, are being um, the, the goal is to, is to make sure that the gender equality is being looked at and being um, promoted. And also, as you, I will give an example of the, the Mexico City First Women Conference but also the Beijing uh, conference, the Beijing that took place in, in, in the conference that took place in Beijing 1995. Um, then there's also this, um, what happened, what is happening at the African level, whereby we have the, 
the Maputo protocol, all these these are uh, being being they're, they're showing that uh, we can relate, we can <laughs> it's it's helping in mainstreaming the standardization process. Um, I submit. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our uh, next speaker, Mr. Lance Thompson. Um, he is currently um, based at the Economic Affairs um, Oil Commission of Europe. Ms., uh, Mr. Lance currently serves as an Economic Affairs uh, Officer. He is also a gender champion within uh, UNICE uh, with a focal point on gender for the trade program. Um, he is like um, going to be speaking on mainstreaming gender and standardization, the gender dynamics um, dimension, sorry, as an integral part of standards development and implementation and as a measure of um, against gender blind standards and he'll be focusing on the benefits and implication of, UNI of the UNICEF initiative as well as the declaration on gender um, responsive standards. So thank you so much Mr. Lance. Thank you Ms. Solomon. Uh, very happy to be here and thank you uh, for the invitation from uh, Arso and Sabs uh, to participate. Just sharing my screen which I hope you can see now. Uh, so I think you've had an update of uh, the work of uh, UNEC at the 2021 uh, event that you uh, had with uh, on the topic. And our chair, Michelle Parkuda, uh, who's from the Canadian uh, Standards Body, uh, was unable to join today. And so uh, she asked me as secretary uh, to make the presentation. I think uh, that uh, everyone in the call uh, understands the importance of standards and that standards are an absolute um, uh, essential in everyday life. Uh, they're in all of the products that, that surround us, and it helps keep the products conform to safety and security requirements, as well as environmental and society uh, safety. Uh, but uh, until rather recently, standards, uh, even though they were trying to be gender neutral, uh, in reality, we're often based on a Caucasian man, age 25 to 30, weighing about 70 kilos. So it uh, did not represent uh, everyone uh, in the world and uh, did not represent all genders either. And this can, being gender blind, uh, can sometimes be as, no, as uh, bad as uh, having a gender bias. Uh, we can see uh, that there can be risks if uh, standards in the products that's, that are based on standards are not gender responsive. For example, the masks uh, that everybody in Europe and around the world were wearing during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and they're really, uh, for women, could pose, cause more threats than to men with the space that uh, is on the sides of the mask, uh, allowing germs to, to get in around the nose as well. Uh, on uh, clothing for professional use. Uh, the woman firefighter in the photo here uh, will have a more difficult time than her male colleagues doing her job, given that the clothing is really oversized uh, on her. Same for equipment uh, for construction. Uh, it was until recently very centered on a male uh, morphology. And so women wanting to operate these types of machines had a more difficult time. This has been resolved obviously now. Uh, the seat belt and security measures in uh, passive restraints in, in cars uh, can also cause different uh, health threats uh, to women and pregnant women. And even uh, applications on cell phones for geolocalization, for example, can have a different impact on women than it can for men. So it's not just the result, like the clothing itself for the firefighters, but uh, the use afterwards. So geolocalization can sometimes be misused in order to identify where a woman is for uh, 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 and things like this. Sorry, sometimes the words come in French. Uh, so the UNEC, we've been working on uh, gender responsive standards since around 2017. And we have our recommendation to that 2018, recommendation U. And this is really 
uh, looking at uh, trying to make uh, standards. So I'm trying to get something out of the way of the screen. Oh. Uh, trying to make standards uh, um, gender responsive, and it gives a, a way forward on uh, how to implement a gender action plan and some of the elements that can be present in a gender action plan. Uh, it also uh, is giving uh, the basis for the declaration on gender responsive standards, which we see in the middle. Uh, that was opened in, for signature in 2019, and there are currently 83 signatories uh, in the African region. ARSO, SMIC, and ASTM are signatories on a regional standards development body level. And on a national level, we have the signatures from Benin, Botswana, Cameroon, Congo, Gambia, Madagascar, Mali, Mauritius, Mozambique, Rwanda, Senegal, South Africa, and Togo. Uh, so all of that, you might have gotten an update at the 2021 webinar uh, of ARSO on gender. Uh, in 2022, we finalized the guidelines on developing gender responsive standards. So this is taking a more step-by-step -step approach on how to uh, go towards developing gender responsive standards and being more inclusive in the participation uh, and the leadership of, uh, of gender standards bodies. Also looking at recruitment, uh, how to have inclusive meetings uh, and in, in steps to ensure that uh, standards are gender responsive. Gen are gender responsive. And we've just finalized uh, a a publication on why gender responsive standards are better for everyone and why it's in the interest not only of governments uh, to promote gender responsive standards but also for technical committees and standardization bodies because if we're able to capture the needs of all uh, the population both men and women uh, the standard will be usable and have the same results or near same results for everyone and so it's in the interest of the technical committees to make sure that what they're doing will indeed uh, uh, respond to the needs of women as well. And of course, for governments to ensure that uh, what they're putting in place as a technical regulation also uh, looks at the gender perspective. Uh, the two small points I'd like to just underline. Uh, there's a question on vocabulary uh, when we're saying gender blind, uh, gender responsive, gender sensitive. It's different. Uh, grades of uh, of incorporating of gender mainstreaming. So of course, gender discrimination or gen gender discriminatory, uh, I hope we all understand what that is. Uh, it's actually actively having a negative impact on, uh, on women or specific genders. Gender blind is to try to be, uh, to ignore that there's any differences in gender and try to create something which is uh, applicable for any gender. Uh, gender sensitive is recognizing that there can be differences uh, for men, women, girls, and boys uh, the, on, for the products that the standards uh, are going to be used for or the processes. And uh, it's just a recognition. And when we move to gender responsive, uh, which is what we do within UNECWP6, we're looking at how to try to resolve uh, these differences and ensure that there are no inequalities. So gender blind can often be as detrimental as gender discriminatory because by trying to ignore that there are differences, it could actually perpetuate stereotypes and, uh, and problems that women might face. Being gender sensitive is an excellent step forward and it's uh, a necessary step to take, uh, but uh, it's not only recognizing that there are problems or there could be differences, it's really moving forward to a gender responsive approach where we're going to try to address those inequalities and ensure that they don't persist. One other small point I'd like to underline from the guidelines is the approach to standards development, which uh, we put forward in the guideline. So we take the approach that there, we assume that there are differences. We're developing a new standard for a process or product, and we assume that there are differences. This is very different from the past because we always assumed in the past that there are no difference, that it's gender blind. And when you do that, then you put the obligation on people who believe that there could be a gender difference, the obligation of proof on them. 
to come forward and demonstrate that there will be a difference uh, from the standard that's being uh, proposed. And by taking the alternate uh, assumption that there will be differences, it puts the burden of proof on those who are developing the standard to demonstrate that there will be no differences for men or, or women, that the outcome should be the same, or that indeed there are differences, and then how the standard will integrate those differences in order to ensure that the result will be the same for men and women. So I think this is a very interesting uh, approach and something that we should try to, to strive for in, in uh, standards development. Uh, this, I believe, is uh, my last slide, just to let you know of some other initiatives that we're doing within WP6. Uh, we have a e-learning platform called LearnQI. There are four modules available already on conformity assessment, market surveillance, and risk management. And then the fourth on gender responsive standards. It takes about two hours to go through. Uh, and if you have colleagues who are not sure why you're working on gender responsive standards or what it actually means, uh, this is a very good introductory uh, to that. Uh, I think the slides will be made available after the, the, the call. And all of these uh, QR codes are also clickable. So if you click on the, the QR code, it will bring you to uh, the website as well to that link. We also have a training manual. This goes into a bit more depth and a bit more uh, uh, detail on uh, gender responsive standards and good practices that can be put into, into place. We had a targeted workshop about a year ago uh, for gender focal points of the uh, uh, declaration, and it did look in large part at the uh, gender action plans and how these uh, would be put into place. And then we have video testimonials as well. They're very brief, about two minutes each, and they can also help explain to others uh, what uh, what we're doing and what uh, why that could be important. And then. Uh, there's other materials on uh, on the website. We are working right now on uh, gender action plans and uh, identifying what are the best practices in gender action plans. So Dr. Bisoon, I'd like to get in touch with you very soon to uh, maybe fill out a short questionnaire that we have on uh, uh, gender action plan implementation. And we hope to have a publication on that in 2024. And we've just completed a white paper on code lists for gender, sex, and salutations uh, so that these could be rolled over into um, uh, uh, electronic data communication uh, and inherit uh, all of that information there. I hope that I kept within the time. Uh, if you have any questions, very happy to answer also in French. Thank you. Thank you so much for a very insightful presentation. It's very great to see how uh, and how many changes have taken place over the years and also the developments that are taking place. What I found particularly interesting uh, interesting about your presentation was the proactive response in terms of being more gen uh, gender responsive as opposed to taking a more reactive approach, which obviously then puts the onus on the people to prove that those materials don't work for them and that they're not suitable. You also mentioned that you um, UNICEF also developed a guide in terms of how to become more gender responsive in terms of sharing it also with different government departments and different governments around the world. I just wanted to find out, do you think that a phased-in approach might be more suitable for this? And how does one go about uh, implementing something that, like this in terms of your respective country and the different sectors? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And of course, uh, every country is going to have different cultural backgrounds and societal backgrounds. So implementing gender responsive standards in France, where I'm living, it might be very different from implementing uh, gender responsive standards in uh, Iran. Uh, for example. So we have to take the, those considerations into account and um, to uh, even small steps are steps forward. So even if we're not able to go directly to a, a gender responsive approach, already taking a gender sensitive approach to realize that there could be differences is already a, a very big step ahead in many places around the world. So as you say, a phased approach could be uh, quite interesting for that. In the uh, repository of gender action plans that we're working on within WP6, uh, we're looking at the implementation and how countries have worked about this. And Rwanda, who I think we'll hear from later on, uh, has filled this out uh, in our uh, repository. And we're hoping to have other examples from various 
different types of economies, different regions of the world in order to, to compare what's comparable and not just say there's one size that fits all, but to see like what has been done in Rwanda or in South Africa that might be able to repli be replicated in Mali or in uh, Kenya. Uh, and then also in Canada. Uh, so yes, I completely agree, uh, phased approach and taking into consideration differences. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm a firm believer in context matters, and I love that that is an approach that one can pursue in terms of this. Thank you again for your insights. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Emmanuel Gatara. He is currently the National Standards Division Manager in Rwanda, or for the Rwandan Standards Bureau or Board. Um, Mr. Gatara holds a Master's Degree in Engineering of Quality, Safety and Environmental Management from Kadi Aya University and a Bachelor's Degree in Industrial chemistry from a university in Morocco. Mr. Katara's presentation is focused on the gender agenda, sorry, the gender agenda in standardization strategies and programs, the gender indicators and criteria in standards development for gender responsive standards and outcomes. And he will focus on the Rwandan experience and initiative, such a tongue to stand, definitely a fascinating uh, presentation, I'm sure. Um, Mr. Katara, the floor is yours. Uh, Mr. Gatara, we can see your presentation. I do believe that you might be on mute. Thank you very much, Salomon. Uh, can you hear me? Um, yes, we can, Mr. Katara. Yeah, I uh, hope you are able to see the shared screen. Uh, yes, we can also see your screen and we can also see your visual. Thank you so much for sharing your camera with us. Okay, very much. I'll try to be brief. I don't know how much time am I allocated to use. Uh, but uh, the, the content of the presentation is all about uh, the RISB experience or the RISB agenda, equality agenda, uh, specifically focusing on the use of standards to achieve uh, SDG number five uh, goals. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to let you know that this initiative, uh, uh, I mean, our gender equality starts with a declaration uh, which we have signed in 2020, uh, but uh, signing this declaration took a lot of time. Uh, I've been aware of the declaration in 2018, uh, but uh, uh, Mr. Gatara, I think we lost you on audio. Let me, uh, as I said, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes. So I was telling you that uh, the sign the on gender responsive standards and standard development, uh, uh, the one that uh, our colleagues that have presented uh, before uh, try to highlight, I will not go, going to talk about of the declaration, uh, but uh, in this presentation, I'm going, I'm going to focus on the RSB uh, model and the indicators that we have selected to, uh, to focus on uh, while designing our model. Uh, especially uh, talking about of the declaration, uh, you all know that uh, mainly uh, the objective of the declaration focuses on standards and standard development, uh, but also uh, the internal transformation within any national standard bodies. But uh, from our side, uh, we try to go beyond 
as we are not only uh, providing uh, uh, standard development and services, also we provide uh, certification services, uh, testing services, and other services that are uh, for Odo or uh, the way the, the journey in which we have perceived it. Uh, we, 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 we try to make sure that uh, the standards that are being developed are addressing uh, the special requirement, uh, not only in product specification, but also in management system requirement. So uh, from here, uh, we aim at developing standards that are addressing uh, special needs for women and males. And also, when talking about standard development, you cannot uh, forget the equal consideration of female and male in standardization work, uh, where uh, we are focusing on, and actually, this is the, the activity that has been undertaken, uh, the equal representation in standard development structures, including uh, standard committees, uh, where it was necessary uh, to have equal contribution of mandate, uh, it is all about the access. Of course, uh, we are not uh, a discriminatory institution. Everyone has the right to access our services. But uh, going forward, it is not enough. Uh, we need to go beyond to assess these challenges, hindering either males or women uh, in accessing our services and putting in place a different mechanism to, uh, to address these special needs. And there are some various initiatives that are, uh, are in place to uh, go beyond addressing such kind of uh, special uh, needs uh, addressing the challenges or limitation to access our services and uh, as it facilitation agency uh, and be sure and confirm that everyone that has accessed our services has has got or has accessed or has pro 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 providing. So there is a mechanism here to go beyond and assess uh, how impactful uh, was our services to both women and male-owned businesses. And where we are not able to overcome the challenges, we make an advocacy to bridge uh, that, to break these gender gaps. So uh, before, uh, to, to ensure uh, alignment of our intervention with these uh, four indicators, uh, it was necessary to map internal and external stakeholders that are necessary uh, to align the RISB ambitions uh, with the, the, the current, uh, the current uh, context. Uh, first of all, uh, before signing the declaration, uh, this is an experience that we have uh, gone through, and I think it can be uh, inspire other national standard bodies, because if there is no uh, internal engagement, uh, the initiatives will be very difficult to be to achieve, to be achieved, and the target set will be not easy to be achieved. So uh, even before for signing the declaration at RISB level, we have conducted uh, internal consultations uh, at all levels of the, the organization, starting from the top management to the operational uh, staffs. And um, having that concrete and uh, grid uh, uh, way forward, RISB has decided to sign the gender responsive uh, standards declaration. Uh, and also, uh, we, the, 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 the consultation was not only limited to internal consultation, we decided also to, to, to map external stakeholders in achieving the national priorities that we have decided to, to, to set as a national standard body. 
Uh, from that specific point, uh, we managed to have uh, the Gender Monitoring Office and the UNDP on board. Uh, currently, we are very proud to have that partnership. And uh, uh, under that partnership, we have managed to achieve uh, various uh, milestones, uh, including uh, conducting a gender assessment, uh, which has been informative in gender action plan preparation for the five years. And also under that program, under that partnership, we have managed to train and coach uh, RISB staff on gender equality. Uh, and also we managed to make a gender equality policy, uh, which is currently uh, informing uh, our interventions. And also uh, our tools, our operational uh, documents are, are, have been modified to, to inform us on how we are impacting uh, we are in line with the set uh, plans, five years plans, activities. So mainly our action plan was focusing on developing standards or participating international and uh, regional projects uh, about uh, gender equality in standardization, especially uh, at national level, uh, we have established a specific uh, national uh, technical committee, this is RISB TC 58, uh, specifically uh, uh, has having uh, the, the responsibility or the assignment to undertake uh, uh, all activities pertaining to gender related standards, but also to serve as a national mirror committee uh, to these regional and international standards, uh, where currently we are participating uh, in various projects uh, coordinated at ISO level in two project committees and uh, one technical committee. And uh, currently we have uh, established a gender mainstreaming, uh, a gender equality committee at RSB level. Uh, which is the one guiding uh, the, this gender mainstreaming activities, not only in RSB structures, uh, but also um, uh, in the mandate of RSB in the services that we are providing. Uh, specifically, uh, this is the committee uh, working closely with the, uh, the ISO TC, no, sorry, uh, RSB TC 58 on mainstreaming gender uh, in private and public sector. So uh, actually this committee is assigned, I mean, the ISO, uh, sorry, RSBTC 58 is the one uh, assigned to work on this uh, project, uh, support streaming, uh, uh, then, uh, uh point of course to have RISB uh, uh, having RISB uh, as a gender uh, responsive uh, 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 the gaps in RISB structures and um, uh, leadership uh, positions and try to guide the management on how to fill this. Uh, gender gaps. Uh, the other assignment, uh, as highlighted on the five years plan, uh, was Katera? to accommodate. Yes. Uh, one Can more you hear me? Uh, one more minute left, sir. Ah, okay, okay. So one assignment, uh, one other assignment was to make sure that under this uh, RSB TC58 uh, was to make sure that uh, there is an alignment of the ongoing gender equality seed uh, to, to have it aligned with the international best practices uh, guide things certification services it is a and uh, operational at gender monitoring office and uh, specifically on that specific point RSB has published RS uh, 560 uh, standards uh, on gender uh, equality, and, but this is a management system standards highlighting what are the requirements for gender uh, promotion, gender 
uh, implementation and accountability uh, requirements. So uh, maybe this is the requirement. To, you may give me like some. us to give you the highlights of uh, RSB website. So this is the first milestone that this committee has managed to deliver. Uh, to, 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 to deliver. And uh, there are other projects ongoing uh, to be considered in this fiscal year work plan. I think uh, without taking too much of your time, I want to hand over the floor to Solomon. Thank you very much. Uh, Sanet, you forgot to unmute. Please unmute. Oh, thanks so much. Um, oh, I just wanted to find out in terms of your particular country, what impact do you envision that these standards will have in terms of women in business, in terms of Rwanda, and how do you think this will impact on them in terms of trading in the country? Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, currently, uh, Rwanda Standards Board specifically is among uh, the trade facilitation agencies. And uh, as you said, uh, it is uh, among one of the uh, key players in the implementation of national policies, including uh, this uh, policy promoting the, the local made product. So availing these standards, it is an important stage in mainstreaming gender equality in the private and public sector, where all trade facilitation agencies uh, would be having uh, the, guiding, uh, uh, the guiding tool uh, in a way that uh, they are being given a, a kind of an orientation or a kind of uh, guiding uh, uh, requirement uh, while aligning the initiative in women empowerment, uh, gender equality, and uh, uh, it is uh, important for us to, to be part of this uh, initiative and uh, RSB will contribute, uh, will continue to intervene, will contribute, we will always uh, provide support to make sure that all the support ecosystem are considering or are having uh, the key uh, guiding uh, tools uh, such as standards in aligning the intervention uh, with the women empowerment and the economic transformation uh, journey in which we are all contributing as uh, members of that support ecosystem that are supporting uh, not only uh, businesses but also having this tra transformation journey or uh, 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 bringing in this inclusivity this uh, uh, equal opportunities that are availed to all uh, women and men's businesses operators. Uh, actually, RSB, we, as I said, is there to, to, to provide, to pray that lot of providing these guiding tools that will support not only uh, the business operators, but also uh, supporting the trade facilitation agencies in aligning the intervention with the with a provision of equal opportunity to, to men, to women and men. Uh, in promoting this shared contribution to economic transformation of the country. Thank you. Thank you so much for a very comprehensive answer. Um, so colleagues, we have moved from unpacking the gender agenda towards moving towards gender representative, uh, representativeness, and as well as now uh, a focus on gender accountability in terms of the globe. Um, colleagues, thank you so much for wonderful presentations. These are very insightful. They will obviously be at the end of the session with those present. Um, kindly allow me to welcome our next speaker, Ms. Trudy Hartenberg. 
Um, Trudy is currently the executive director for trade for the Trade Law Center, also called Tralic. She is she has a special interest in terms of capacity building, and she heads up She Governs Trade Program for Young Women and Policymakers. Trudy's presentation will be on the standardization or standardization as a technical barrier to trade in Africa. The experience of women traders SMEs at national levels, including the informal cross-border trade, um, and she will also be focusing on the voice of women enterprise represent, uh, representative. Um, thank you so much, Trudy, for uh, taking time out of your schedule to speak to us. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Zanette, and good afternoon, colleagues. I am going to close the video because I do have some challenges with um, my connectivity. Um, as Sunet has indicated, I'm focusing in the context of the trade governance agenda on a number of issues related to gender responsive approaches to standards, technical regulations, conformity assessment, but also sharing some context on women's economic participation across the African continent. As many colleagues before me have already indicated, we recognize from a trade governance perspective that standardization, and here we talk about standards, technical regulations, conformity assessment, are key to a safe, predictable, legitimate trade environment. And this is important, colleagues, not only in terms of promoting intra-Africa trade, as we see in the case of the African continental free trade area, but also changing how and what we trade with the rest of the world. We recognize, however, that standards in their various manifestations may become non-tariff barriers, not only in and of themselves, they can be overly restrictive, but in the way they are implemented, how we apply and get certification, for example, may adversely impact particularly women um, traders and producers. Standardization, extremely important also for Africa's industrialization. And we now know that the AFCFTA has been adopted as a framework for Africa's industrialization to support value addition and diversification of economic activity. This is important also to promote research, development, innovation, and herein lie important links to the broad standards and standardization agenda. And so we see links between the instruments such as standards and, for example, intellectual property rights, and I'll say a little bit more about that. The effective participation by women in investment spheres, in production, in trade, extremely important, supported by a gender responsive trade governance agenda, and this has to include gender responsive standards. Otherwise, the AFCFDA's development objectives will not be achieved. But what does the landscape look like for women business in Africa? And colleagues across the continent, women and medium small micro enterprises predominate as far as all our economies are concerned. This means that if we take a look at the AFCFDA agenda, trade and gender, but also the promotion of small and medium and micro enterprises, absolutely essential to ensure an inclusive, sustainable development outcome from the AFCFDA. The data indicates that 80% of businesses in Africa are in fact in the category of small and medium enterprises. 85% of economic activities are actually classified as informal sector activities. These would be informal traders, but also informal businesses that are outside the formal economic structures. And this means, for example, that those businesses face additional challenges, such as access to finance, because without a bank account, it is not possible to get a loan from a banking institution. 90% of the labor force in the informal sector is in fact constituted by women. Of all the informal cross-border traders across the continent, 70% are women. 
The pure demographics for colleagues mean that we have to look at gender responsive trade governance, and this includes also gender responsive standards and standardization making sure that women are involved in the standards development processes, implementation, but also benefit from the standards that have been developed. Trellick is doing a survey across the continent, and I'm pleased to share with you here the responses from businesses at various border posts for the countries of Burundi, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. We have since added to this list of countries, and I'm very happy to share more data with you as soon as we have analyzed that. Of all the businesses surveyed, 66% are majority female owned. The sectors in which we find most women so far from the survey, cosmetics and the beauty, care, beauty and healthcare sector, agriculture, agribusiness development, forestry and fisheries, textiles, clothing and leather. Colleagues, this is important because women should be represented across all sectors of the economy. And therefore, we often find that when we take a look at the data, and there's a focus specifically on women in particular sectors, we almost are bowing to an assumption that they should continue to be represented in those sectors. This is not true. And herein lie some of the barriers that we need to be breaking down to support access for women entrepreneurs across the entire economy. But the size distribution of businesses is also extremely interesting. If we take a look at majority female owned businesses, we see that a very, very small percentage can be classified as large businesses. Most are small businesses, micro businesses and medium businesses. Majority male owned businesses, by contrast, feature a much larger proportion of large businesses and medium sized businesses. Again, this indicates that there are specific barriers to women's participation across our economic sectors. When we take a look at the utilization of trade preferences across the continent, particularly by women-owned and women-led businesses, we see distinct differences between men and women-owned businesses. Tariff preference utilization, in other words, trading under the regime of the EAC or ECOWAS or COMESA, indicates that 25% of women-owned businesses, majority women-owned businesses, are actually trading under those preferences, so getting the benefit of the lower duties, whereas 52% of men are trading under those preferences. The question is, why this difference? And our survey indicates that there is a distinct lack of access to information and therefore a lack of awareness of the trade preferences and the opportunities. There's limited information specifically about the benefits, but also the requirements to get access to those preferences, including rules of origin, standards, regulations, SBOs or TBT certificates that may be required to trade across borders. We have also found from the survey that many small scale traders, and these are predominantly women, avoid border posts. These harassment, many non-tariff barriers that they encounter at border posts, and therefore they trade in a very unsafe environment away from the legitimate border posts. This brings a number of implications for us as we look now to the phase of implementation of the African continental free trade area. Information specifically designed and targeted to women investors, producers and traders is absolutely essential if we are going to make the AFCFTA deliver on our development outcome objectives. Standards and non-tariff barriers, I think from a trade governance perspective, what we do find is that standards are often associated with the non-tariff barriers the traders encounter. And if we take a look at the history of trade governance, then the inclusion of standards is a relatively new phenomenon. So going back to 1947 and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, very few references to standards at that 
stage. But it's really in the 1980s that we start to see discussions around standards becoming particularly important as there is recognition that non-tariff barriers are becoming more and more important as tariff barriers have become reduced. The result is that in the World Trade Organization, we have the technical barriers to trade and the SBS agreements, and they came into force along with the establishment of the World Trade Organization on the 1st of January 1995. I think if we take a look, and as Lance and others have indicated, standards by purpose, by nature, by a number of important characteristics, we find that within that classification, there are particular challenges that women face. Lance has referred to, for example, design issues and standards which support particular design of, for example, protective personal equipment and so on. And therefore, when we take a look at the achievement of legitimate public policy objectives, this has to mean that gender responsive standards, technical regulation and conformity assessment has to be adopted. Otherwise, the biases against women will become institutionalized. When we take a look at standards and look at some of the new developments, colleagues, I think important to keep in mind that this is a very fast developing area. And with a focus on green transition, for example, we find that the EU Green Deal is now including a number of domestic regulations, for example, on packaging and labeling. And if we are going to be exporting to the EU, we will have to comply with those standards. Women exporters will face particular challenges when it comes to this new generation of standards and standardization. I want to very briefly in my last couple of minutes, Sandra, to say something about industrialization and standards. As I've mentioned, the AFCFDA is a framework for Africa's industrialization. And there's a key focus on cross-border value chain development. Priority sectors have been identified, the automotive sector, pharmaceuticals, agro-processing, transport, logistics, clothing and textiles. And here, the role of women in Africa's industrialization and specifically in value chains and value chain trade is particularly important because women face very, very specific challenges. Non-tariff barriers as a category as a whole have very different incidents when it comes to impacting men and women. So while they may appear to be gender blind or even gender sensitive, they impact women and men very, very differently. So compliance requirements, extremely important. And here again, women face particular challenges. If we take a look at the overall legal compact, the African continental free trade area, the linkages between the standards agenda that we have, for example, the annexes to the protocol on trade and goods on SPS and TBT, and the other legal instruments needs to be examined from a gender perspective as well. And gender responsive approaches, particularly important both in the substance of the protocol on women and youth and trade, but also at implementation level, at the national level. I've mentioned briefly the connection to intellectual property rights. Colleagues, we've discovered um, quite recently that standards that have been developed in a number of African countries for the production of fermented products, fermented food products, have now been given intellectual property right protection, for example, in the European Union, whereas they don't enjoy that in an African context. These are issues particularly important because many of those fermented products are actually produced and traded by women. So very important gender bias there. Other gender biases, which are important also, and that compound the impact of the gender bias. So then we I'll ask in a like, second, sorry, okay. um, relate, for example, to the gender biases in terms of access to finance. And so all of this compounds to, to make women sidelined from the overall economic activities um, and the important opportunities that the AFCFDA brings. 
my last slide just very quickly is the conclusions. I think very important when we take a look at, for example, the Annex on Technical Barriers to Trade, Annex 6 in the AFCFDA, the basis is the WTO agreement, and that's really important. The main focus in the AFCFDA is on cooperation, transparency, technical assistance, and capacity building. And herein lies very good opportunities for women's economic empowerment. But, and I know my colleague Rose will speak to this as well, the protocol on women and youth presents an opportunity for us to mainstream gender and standards and standardization has to be a key focus in that protocol as well. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for a very insightful presentation, especially in terms of covering the key technical barriers to trade associated with the standards um, and especially with regards to women traders and SMEs, as well as just covering what African governments and stand the standardization community should do to mitigate these uh, DBTs. So that was quite fascinating. Um, our next speaker is Ms. Pelisa. So Ms. Pelisa Ngomo is a development economist by profession, agenda justice, and social justice activists with experience rooted from community activism and global movements. Um, Ms. Belisa is an international speaker on macroeconomic issues, gender trade and development, micro sectorial development, women's economic empowerment and access to finance. She holds an honors degree in economics from UWC, which is the University of Western Cape and a master's degree from, in development finance from Stellenbosch University. Ms. Nkoma's presentation today is on harness the trade and economic opportunities of the AFCTFA agreement for the benefits of African women. She'll also be focusing in terms of policy issues and the South African experience. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for grazing us with your presence, Ms. Nkomo. Ms. Nkomo, you are on mute. Oh, can you hear me now? I see there's a hand. Uh, yes, we can. Can the colleague with the hand up just kindly uh, add your chat, your question to the chat function, and then we will just ask that towards the end of the session, if that's okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much for the, for the opportunity to present. I'm really going to write on the back. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Ms. Ngomo. Excellent. All right. Excellent. All right. I'm just going to write on the back of a uh, uh, um, input, which really spoke about trade government. And I think I'm going to bring into a little bit to some of the South African contextual issues. And in the first slide that you see before you here from, is that I just want to demonstrate, this is a slide that demonstrates participation of women and and, and the non -local in terms of this. But I think the slide is really intended to demonstrate that women still do not possess the men, but also there are also gender related factors which are linked with historically with the role of uh, women in society. For instance, if you look in the uh, ground, we are not uh, getting you. We are not getting you. Uh, can Sorry? you just kindly, Ms. Nkomo, can you just kindly pull your device slightly closer to you or can you just move closer to the device? All right. Can I add something? Yes. Uh, yes. I've logged into uh, two devices. Can I, can the host allow me to unmute the other one? Because I think. Yes, the other please. One. Yeah, please, host. Okay, Ms. Nkomo, can you say something so that we can just check if we can hear you? Uh, colleagues, can you just, um, can we just unmute Ms. Nkomo? She signed into two devices. Hi, please unmute the, the second device, not this one. I'm not audible saying on this one. Okay, Ms. Nkoma, can you just say something so that we can just check if there's still an echo? 
All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. All right, okay. Uh, okay, so the is that it's like really seeks to demonstrate that women's participation in policy sectors is actually fairly low and that the the ASSP agreement prevents them to be able to take opportunities for women. I think the next slide is that the key issue is that the opportunities for investing uh, in women. The high growth indicators that we really need to look at, which is around ICT agriculture, um, renewable energy, um, creative industry, tourism, and as well as climate change. And the trade agreement actually creates, I mean, promotes the benefits of integration amongst the country and amongst women as well. Um, But I think the key issue I want to zoom into is that I think we speak quite broadly around the economy. But I think uh, what the agreement creates an opportunity for as a national and as a country, like firstly, is to make sure that it creates clear pathways around women's commercial empowerment by investing in entrepreneurship as a strategic vehicle for growth and for, for, for prosperity. And why that is important is that it means that society needs to start dealing with some of the stereotypes associated with access to education and investing in, um, in entrepreneurship and education and supporting um, women. Because then in that way, what you then do is that you actually facilitate participation of women um, in, in, uh, in economic opportunities. So why do we need to create economic pathways for women? That first, women are needed economic growth, and I think there's, there's sufficient research around that, that women prove innovative ideas, creative ideas, right? And as well as there's a lot of entrepreneurial spirit. If you look, for example, even in the um, in the informal sector, including the cross-border trade, it's actually driven by women, and all what women are looking for is actually a better infrastructure to be able to do their business. And in this context, that's why I'm saying, from a state government perspective, that's why it's crucial that women and if I zoom straight, I just want to move straight because I want to have sufficient time around sectoral trade. So there are four sectors in Africa specifically, which I really quite um, provide immediate benefit for, um, uh, for women to participate in business. One is automotive sector, it's a commercial sector, pharmaceutical, and as well as transport and um, logistics. I want to zoom in straight into automotive. The automotive sector in Africa is expected to grow more than 4 billion in 2027, uh, 2027 due to increased domestic domestic demand, rising cost of income, high production costs. Now, if you think, for instance, about most of the cars that you get to drive in Africa, you think about the seat cover, where do they get manufactured? Uh, for instance, most of the manufacturers are trying. And I'm just picking up the just seat cover that actually links to textile industry. And um, and textile industry is actually linked to actually agricultural industry because you know the more ownership of cows, then you are slaughtering the cows and that allows actually for the production of the uh, seat cover. So I mean that's really one raw material where in fact that can actually produce the um, less capital cost. Hello. Yes, we are still yes, here. Yes, yeah. yeah. oh, okay. yes, because uh, there's less capital cost with less use of um, machinery. So that's something that's a massive uh, opportunity that is um, that could be you know for it. I know that several countries opportunities in few markets, for example, electrical vehicles. One that's an issue that currently piloting some of those. Uh, so there are also other raw materials, for instance, you know, that are linked to copper, platinum, and copper. But I think what then is this kind of, these opportunities are just not going to be able to just fly into the continent without any clear facilitation at a national level. So what it means is that government at the national level must design policies that facilitate women's participation amongst all this. We need to fulfill five critical issues which are linked to 
affect other sectors too. The, the first one is really supporting and on product development. That's the market finance and on product variety. There's a, I don't know whether there's a hacker here or someone who teaches this variety in my group. So there's um, and product development to support women to achieve certain skills, particularly why product development is important is particularly to understand different standards across different countries. I know, for instance, current contemporary agreements, the pillar standards around the negotiations and rules of engagement. And that's really something that's really important and countries must actually allocate funding for that to support women. But also that women must not only remain in the product, primary production of products, in that they need to be upscaled, upscaled into the value chain. And I think I'm just going to stick with this issue around, you know, the state cover, because I think that it's linked to primary production, to um, high value um, uh, um, manufacturing, but also into really consumer goods, which are consumer goods, so it's where it gets installed in the product. That's the first issue. I think the second issue is access to land. We know the social norms associated, for example, with access to land in Africa, and we converted to something similar in South Africa. Even though, from a policy perspective, there's a lot of flex rate, but data shows that 42% of land is actually owned by women, but it's less than actually, you know, 10 to 20 hectares. So, meaning that it doesn't have a lot of um, industrial capacity. And then the third issue that's important, it comes up very strongly in the previous speakers, is around access to finance, and we know the youth associated with access to finance. And then and the other one is really around access to infrastructure, right? So part of that infrastructure, for instance, we need to be able to make sure that women have access to building. Now, just quickly, if I move state as because I see uh, Sanet Oi, she's indicating that my time is up. The issue is around financial um, um, incentives, right? South Africa is really exploring that uh, in the form of credit equity insurance, access to finance through development finance institutions, which actually target women. And the second one is access to markets. They need to be very clear coordinated access to market studies, but at the national level and as well as regional level. And really taking to make sure that women's products actually move from production into market to other countries. Ms. Nkomo, you have one more minute left. As I'm one more minute. Um, um, yes, thank you. Non-financial non support. I think non-financial support is very, it's going to be very important. The amount of is market research, for instance, is export development training, so that we understand the demand around the countries where you want to move to, but also as well as support in terms of global integration process. This is also what the Department of Trade and Industries are currently doing. The yeah, last one is public procurement policy that supports women to be able to really participate effectively and have access to you know, opportunities both at national level and they can use some of that experience to actually export some of these. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Nkomo. Um, colleagues, thank you so much for uh, joining us as we go through our different presentations today. We've had one of our speakers unpacking the uh, gender agenda. We have moved towards more gender responsiveness and adapting standards to suit the different contexts. We had a speaker cover the gender accountability, especially with regards to special requirements and initiatives. One of our other speakers covered women trade in Africa and with a specific focus on trade governance and women's economic contributions. And Ms. Pelisa just covered the uh, opportunities that stem in terms of creating opportunities for women. So our last speaker for this afternoon, or our last presentation, for this afternoon is from Ms. Rose Rono. She's currently a gender and trade economist and uh, sorry, gender and trade economist, and she focuses on policy at the African Trade Policy Center for the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Ms. Um, Rose Rona holds a master's degree in business administration in international business administration. And she is also a PhD candidate at Moore University. Her presentation today would be focused on gender and trade, facilitating participation of women owned businesses in value chain and trade opportunities under the F um, AFCTA. And she will also be focusing on wide integration 
of a gendered lens and gender mainstreaming in national, regional, and continental trade matters um, with particular focus on the UNISA um, initiative. So thank you so much for your time, Ms. Rose. Um, and thank you so much for preparing your presentation for us. Okay, thank you so much, Sanit, uh, for, for having me um, today and uh, to congratulate all the previous speakers on the, the lovely discussions that uh, I've been listening into. So just allow me to put up uh, my presentation if that's okay with you. Ms. Rose, you can just uh, click in the center of your screen on the green share screen button, and then you should be able to share your presentation. Okay. Um, yes, I can see that, yeah. Uh, we're just waiting on our side. I'll just confirm once we can see your presentation. Okay, let me know if you're able to see. Yes, we can see your presentation. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, I'll be talking today about how uh, we can be able to integrate uh, a gender lens in standardization and trade policies in Africa, um, specifically looking at the strategies, structures, and, and capacities for um, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, um, free trade area implementation. And uh, as the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, specifically the Africa Trade Policy Center, uh, we have been supporting um, the implementation of uh, uh, the negotiation, uh, the development of the implementation uh, strategies on, on, of, of different countries um, in relation to the, the Africa continental free trade area, um, specifically also in relation to gender, um, um, the women and youth protocol that um, is part of the, the, the phase two we have been providing uh, technical support on that on, on the negotiations on that and this is basically in, in realization of the importance um, that uh, women play in trade um, in the various roles that women do have especially in Africa um, majority of whom uh, cross-border traders are, are women in African uh, countries uh, African borders and um, looking at some of the various challenges that they do have that prevent them from taking advantage of the opportunities that are presented by, by the agreement. And some of the common um, um, challenges that have been alluded by the previous speakers um, are uh, that lead to these inequalities. Um, look, uh, some of them are access to assets, access to finance, ac access to market information, technology, uh, skills, standards, um, amongst others, um, including uh, risks such as the, the gender wage gap and also of occupational segregation. So this is basically um, the reason why ECA, have, we have been supporting not only the Africa continental free trade area, but other regional economic uh, communities to ensure that um, we have uh, participation of, 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 uh, of, of genders uh, both genders, men, men and women, and also looking at um, how, how um, SMEs and youth can be able to take advantage of the opportunities uh, that are available in the different regional uh, trade agreements. But most importantly, when you're looking at the Africa continental free trade area, um, the agreement already recognizes the importance of gender equality um, and, and uh, the, the fact that uh, improving export capacity of informal suppliers, uh, medium and small medium uh, and micro enterprises, women and youth um, is key towards the successful implementation of the agreement. And some of the research that we have done as ECA include, um, have shown that uh, a projected increase in uh, export of female dominated sectors in manufacturing and agriculture and value addition across the value chain. Um, also projected increase in uh, intra-Africa exports in labor intensive sectors uh, and low skilled wages where we have a concentration of, of women. So it's important that uh, strengthening regional value chains, customs cooperation, trade facilitation, and including um, harmonization of standards is really uh, key or taken seriously in, in, in terms of um, implementation of, of, of this agreement. And, and, and addressing some of the challenges that are there, uh, specifically the non-tariff barriers, which disproportionately affect uh, more men than women when it comes to, to trade. So in terms of our strategy as uh, um, ECA, 
we have been supporting different countries to be able to, uh, first of all, develop their national implementation strategies of the Africa continental free trade area. And uh, in supporting the implementation of strategies, we have also been supporting the gender mainstreaming of these strategies, basically ensuring that the strategies have taken into consideration um, uh, the challenges of both men and women um, in, in, in the context of, of, uh, of the different countries um, that are there. So in terms of our approach towards it uh, uh, is country-based. Uh, looking at the data, um, gender disaggregated data that is available, consultation with key stakeholders, um, identifying interventions uh, with links to existing policies, and also improving institutional capacities um, for gender mainstreaming. So this has been our approach. And so far, we have supported over 20 countries, quite a number of them who are in SACU, um, to not only develop their, um, their national implementation strategies, but also um, to mainstream these strategies uh, for gender. And some of the lessons that we've learned uh, from um, the gender mainstreaming um, work that we've been uh, doing is that uh, com uh, complementary specific uh, and context specific national and regional policies are required uh, to be able to achieve um, gender equitable out outcomes for the implementation. So it's not a blanket fit all. Each country does have their own um, challenges or does have their own uh, imbalances when it comes to gender equality. So um, we have, uh, those are some of the lessons that we've learned um, as we work on on, on, uh, on mainstreaming and also developing of the um, supporting development of the national strategies. Also advancing gender equitable outcomes in the CFTA uh, should be a central goal. So, um, and the approach that we do have is that uh, um, um, gender mainstreaming ensures that countries do utilize, uh, fully utilize their, their capacities and are able to compete um, effectively by utilizing both um, the capacities of men, women, and also um, MSMEs and, and also youth, some of whom do have several challenges when it comes to um, um, utilizing opportunities under trade agreements such as the, the Africa continental free trade area. I'm going to just highlight some of uh, a study that we did um, together with ASO and AUC on identifying uh, priority products and value chains for standard harmonization in Africa. And um, one of the objectives or the objectives of this was basically to identify priority Africa value chains, identify priority products for standardized harmonization uh, within this value chain. And um, the scope was um, at the REC level, COMESA, ESC, ECAS, ECOWAS, SADAC, and UMA. And in terms of the framework, uh, we looked at the number of complementary uh, techniques. So basically some of it include identifying commonly traded routes and helping to facilitate the expansion of uh, existing to Africa trade, um, estimating the potential export basket, identifying an unex unexploited uh, potential for intra-Africa trade um, and opportunities under the CFTA, uh, reviewing uh, regional, um, uh, rec rec uh, standardized, uh, regional economic communities, um, industrialization priorities, harmonizing uh, and harmonizing standards, uh, and also comparing the priorities identified um, through um, in the study. So in terms of the study results, um, and, uh, and uh, a prioritization of, of sectors. We, we looked at two criteria for identifying priority products for standardization and uh, standard harmonization at regional level. And um, the priorities um, or the criteria identified as most suitable um, is the product uh, must have you know, comparative advantage and is competitive at least in two regional economic communities and then also a harmonization standard for the product should already exist in at least one of the regional economic communities. And in the context of gender, um, looking at uh, considering female dominated sectors in terms of prioritization of, um, of, of uh, uh, products that um, should be harmonized. So in terms of the structures, um, the cooperation on quality infrastructure, um, so on small businesses, uh, um, score the infrastructure environment comparatively poor. So in terms of utilization of, uh, 
of the structures that are there, you find that small businesses and even women and youth uh, do not have uh, the capacity to be able to utilize the, the structures that are there in place, the quality structures that are there in place to help them to comply. So this is because of the complexities and differences uh, in quality infrastructure that constrained uh, trade. Um, RECs also have, uh, some RECs have made progress to harmonize quality standards, but they also uh, remain quite a bit of gaps in others. Um, and then the, the CFTA offers that opportunity to be able to cooperate more effectively on quality infrastructure systems at the continental level. So you can see there the spaghetti ball, ball with the different regional economic communities all having uh, differences uh, in standards. And, and this is where now ASO comes in and also ECA and other partners to be able to see how the harmonization and standardization can be done um, specifically also looking at the priority uh, products that I have, have, I have mentioned, looking at uh, uh, CAN products which are uh, dominated by men, by women uh, and youth, how ca they can be uh, prioritized and also where uh, standards already uh, exist. So we say that there's no need of uh, reinventing the wheel. And um, in terms of our recommendation, we're looking at, uh, we recommend um, mainstreaming gender in terms of national implementation strategies and action plans. Um, and uh, that's the work that we've been doing. And specifically to standards, uh, recognizing the challenges that women do have um, in, in uh, um, accessing the standards in terms of cost, in terms of the complexities, then at the regional level, uh, supporting uh, collaboration and building technical capacities um, through the existing uh, regional economic community infrastructures. And then at the continental level, utilizing uh, the continental structures that are there in place, um, such as ASO, PAKI, um, as anchors for harmonization. And I think uh, this webinar today really uh, brings that to light. And then at the international uh, standards, definitely considering WTO and ISO um, as important sources of best practices. Yes, I know for some for uh, some of us recommend African standards for African uh, products, but it's important also to aspire for um, international uh, standards because we don't operate in isolation. Uh, we also need to be looking at um, beyond even as we are building into Africa trade, uh, can we be able to uh, capitalize on the opportunities that are there in the international market, which some of the standards have been quite difficult, expensive and complex, especially, especially for women uh, to be able to, to reach. So in terms of the roles of RECs, um, uh, they do serve as the building blocks, blocks for the CFTA and uh, they need to continue uh, playing a, a crucial role um, in, in ensuring that uh, African quality system, infrastructure systems have been harmonized, especially in light of the Africa continent of Richard era that brings together all the RECs. So we need to work together to be able to expedite harmonization of standards at REC level, starting at REC level, so that at the continental level, once we have all the RECs harmonized, then it becomes very easy to be able to harmonize um, at the continental level. We also have some RECs that have made progress in the co coordinating quality uh, policy, and therefore, if there are any existing capacities um and uh, um those are those are the, the if uh, therefore have existing capacities and knowledge to inform uh continental uh, harmonization so such recs would be used as uh, as best practices for other recs also regional economic communities can contribute to the uh, cfta infrastructure quality for um, uh, institutional quality for quality infrastructure through coordinating uh, implementation at, at the regional level. And also uh, the CFTA can also be built into the uh, side activity cooperation structures, uh, work programs. Um, and Ms. This, Rose, uh, yes, um, yes. one more minute left. Okay, I'm just finishing, I'm just finishing. So let, let me just go towards uh, uh, um, my, my last slide. So in terms of the role of the, the RECs in inclusive uh, CFTA implementation, it's important that uh, the RECs do have in place uh, frameworks, programs, networks, um, data analysis, stakeholder coordination, um, and put in place timelines uh, 
uh, to ensure that the, the uh, national implementation strategies that have been put in place um, are not only uh, um, looking at, uh, um, uh, at the, are actually inclusive of gender, inclusive of SMEs, and also inclusive of, uh, of youth. So I will finish there and uh, um, uh, welcome any questions that you may have. Colleagues, I would like to thank each of you for taking such complex issues and creating very nuanced uh, answers for us in terms of your different perspectives in terms of this. It was very fascinating to learn from both those in practice and also those who do research on these issues, especially in the run up to Women's Month in South Africa, which is on August 9th. Um, thank you so much for taking your time out of your schedules. Thank you so much for joining us. To those who have posed questions in the chat, we unfortunately slightly over time. Um, so if it's okay with with you um, kindly note that the presentations will be shared with you. Um, the host has seen the request for sharing the recording with you and will get back to you in terms of that. I just would like to thank both the host and co-host for this amazing initiative. There is so much that we can learn in terms of women in trade on the African continent and it was so lovely to see how this ties in in terms of international standards. Um, without further ado, I am giving back to the host. Thank you so much for entrusting me with you wonderful presenters. And to those around the world, thank you so much for joining us and for tuning in. Um, thank you so much. Okay, bye. Thank you very much, Sanet. And um, indeed it has been a very wonderful session uh, looking at all the presentations. Uh, very good insights, uh, very good uh, kind of uh, work uh, going on uh, and much attention being paid to ensure that uh, we attain a level of equality, we attain a level of equity in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, women participate in uh, all spheres of our economies, our, our trade aspects and social aspects and that are quite a lot of um, uh, protocols, a lot of policy issues have been put in place to ensure that uh, we all get this facilitated and acted upon. I believe that uh, we shall continue to ex explore all the areas that have been mentioned. Uh, we shall look at all the challenges that have been mentioned and ensuring that uh, these kinds of discussions have the impacts uh, that uh, we expect, such as mainstreaming of gender and standardization and adoption of uh, gender inclusive culture. I know sometimes when we talk about it, people are looking at it from one lens that is more focused on women. But at the same time, we have to remember that uh, if you don't uh, treat both genders uh, in, a go in an equitable way, then uh, you will create an imbalance. And those are the things that we want to avoid. Uh, the second point, of course, gender equality and women's empowerment as per the Agenda 2063 and the UN, the, the UN uh, uh, SDGs uh, 2030. That is one of the things that you need to look at very carefully. Uh, are we going to meet those? Uh, we shall be having uh, an unmet goal. Uh, we're also looking at gender responsible standards and their implementation as tools for gender equality and women's empowerment. Uh, that is something that... Uh, um, very active role. And if you look at uh, our flagship uh, sustainability standards, you'll find that these are issues that we took into account uh, quite a while back. And as the discussions are going on at the AFCFTA level, uh, the AUC level, at uh, UNECA level, uh, we have actually given our draft standards, which we had initially developed in this, uh, to, to show that the standards we've done so far are uh, take into account uh, gender responsive aspects. And we are not only doing that, but we're also do, looking at the staff levels and all that, we are also working in that direction. Number four, we are also look, looking at gender balance in leadership and in all levels of standardization organizations. And I think we are encouraging uh, all these activities to take place. So uh, because of time, we cannot go through all this. Uh, we will, uh, um, of course, share this and ensure that we can get this uh, done. So the next um, webinar will be done uh, in partnership with uh, the uh, Science Organization of Nigeria. 
and it will be the theme will be trade barriers in agricultural trade. Uh, if you are looking at uh, the continent, most of the priorities uh, that have been uh, done, you find all the studies point to agriculture and agro processing. But we also understand that this is the area where we have a lot of uh, difficulties. Uh, what are we doing in that respect? Also, of course, in partnership with uh, development uh, organizations like uh, UNECA and FDP, uh, partnered, have partnered to develop standards to facilitate trading this. Uh, we are having quite a lot of discussions and projects that are in, uh, in that light uh, to ensure that we can address the, the barriers through the standards and other related instruments. Uh, next slide. Uh, let's move. So at, at this point in time, uh, if we can move to the next slide. Uh, I, I think um, at this point in time, I'll give back uh, to our co-host, uh, Sadwir, uh, maybe if you can highlight some of the issues uh, that South, South Africa is uh, doing, uh, some of your programs uh, that uh, you would like uh, your attention to. And of course, your last take uh, on the webinar today. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, and, and firstly, I would just like to thank Sunet for an excellent moderation of a very valuable session. Uh, secondly, I would like to thank all the speakers, uh, the panelists who have made very interesting and informative presentations on a very important theme. Colleagues, um, I must say that we must all agree that there's a lot of work that still needs to happen. And in order to initiate uh, this work that needs to happen, uh, we need to embrace various issues and, and, and foster change. That is the first step that we need to take. We need to acknowledge that there is firstly a problem. Secondly, we need to create a policy and a strategy. And thirdly, we need to make sure that we develop a pragmatic action plan in implementing gender equality. Um, the, uh, the colleagues have expressed a number of initiatives uh, as panelists. And, uh, and uh, colleagues, I think uh, there's an opportunity for you to take up on the uh, initiative uh, that Lance presented as UNECE around the e-learning platform, as well as training manuals that are available on gender responsive standards uh, and good practice. Um, I think uh, get in touch uh, with Lance or get into the website. So uh, that will you know, give us uh, some good practices in terms of implementation of gender responsive standards. Um, Trudy gave us some very hard hitting statistics, um, Trudy. Uh, and again, we must, must deal with the reality um, and, and these are around, as an example, 85% of economic activities uh, in Africa are in the informal sector. But more importantly to our topic, 90% of the informal trading in Africa are conducted by women. Um, and the other astonishing statistic, uh, which is a reality, is that there are four, fewer women representation in large businesses as compared to, uh, to men. I think it's time for us to, to, to take a stance. And uh, I think there's a lot of talking being conducted. And I think what we need to do is we continuously talk the talk. And I think that time has expired. We need to walk the walk, colleagues. And I think that there's a lot of work that we, we need to endeavor. Cooperation, collaboration is key to how we achieve this because colleagues pointed out there's different developmental aspects of the different countries, which is pretty diverse in the African continent. And we need to make sure that we support ourselves uh, and, and, uh, and the region. Gender equality, equality um, should address a number of pillars. And this goes beyond trade and standardization. Matters to be addressed includes amongst a, a number of other things around anti-discrimination, ensuring inclusivity, one very important aspect that you know, uh, does not relate to maybe trade and standardization is protection against gender-based violence. The burden of care, pay equality, empowerment, health and safety, and access to finance. You would recall that pay equality is a very uh, important topical aspect with the Women's Football World Cup taking place. And there's a number of 
last minute negotiations uh, between the teams, the players and the managers and the, and the various directorates of the football associations in making sure that they are adequately paid. That shouldn't be the case. That is just one example of what, uh, how women are being discriminated uh, in their professional lives as well. Uh, from a SAB's perspective, I'm very um, happy to, uh, to share um, our current uh, guideline on gender responsible standards and action plan. And uh, we'll share that with our so colleagues can have a, a good understanding of where we are and how we're doing things. Uh, it's a long journey. It's not an easy journey in standardization and making sure we, we include standardize gender responsible standards and standards development. But I think if we start uh, small and set uh, targets uh, and move towards and, and direct initiatives towards those targets, we'd certainly achieve them. So once again, it's been a great pleasure to be part and co-host this very important uh, session. Uh, and I wish our so uh, all the best in their future webinars. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Zadwi, and uh, thank you all the panelists. Thank you, Sanet, for your excellent uh, moderation. And we also thank uh, all the participants uh, who joined us, and we don't take you for granted. We appreciate your, your, your uh, participation. And would like to, if you're able, uh, to, you, you turn on your camera so that uh, we take a snap of those who participated for purposes of publicity and, of course, uh, evidence of participation. So if you uh, all please do that so that we take and then we shall post this uh, on. Um, ICT, tell us when you are through. Keep your smile, please, until you are told um, not to smile or they are finished. Thank you very much. We took the screenshots. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, we welcome you to our next uh, webinar. And it will be, uh, as we have said, the next one will be with Nigeria Standards Organization of Nigeria. And uh, we shall be seeing what happens. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.